Can you hear me now? I think that Sav just might have figured it out. Let me know if you guys can hear me. I can't even believe that it would have been that simple. Oh my gosh. So you guys, I was sitting here talking to myself for however long and I'm like, no one's responding. I wonder why. Okay. We're about to get underway. Thank you so much, Zav. Um, she helped me behind the scenes. <laughs> okay. So, um, I was saying hello to everybody. So, hello everyone <laughs> i actually said everyone's name but what i want to um say is that usually what what the plan was here was i was going to pre-record a lot of these stories so if i made a mistake i could take you know edit the mistakes out edit out mouth noises like we were talking about and um that didn't happen so i'm gonna read for two hours and wherever we end up we end up and we'll pick up part two um, either tomorrow or in like a couple of days. Odin, my dog is here snoring. Um, I'm going to try. Those are pictures that I'm sharing my screen. Like, uh, I don't, I thought I could share my entire screen, but I guess I have to be in the corner or something. I don't know. Maybe I don't. I don't know. Let me see. I'm scared to touch stuff now because I'm scared I'm going to remove myself. But anyways, um, they're going to be just pictures I've taken. They're not really edited pictures, but it's better than just looking at a black screen. So this is for um, in memory of Gabby Petito. She had her uh, memorial today. And um, let's get underway. You guys ready? Just relax and put in your earphones or Get your drink, if it's water, coffee, whatever you guys drink, wine, and we'll get started. Okay, so the prologue. At first, the new owner pretends he never looked at the living room floor, never really looked. Not the first time they toured the house, not when the inspector showed them through it. They'd measure rooms and told the movers where to set the couch and piano, hauled in everything they owned, and never really stopped to look at the living room floor. They pretend. Then, on the first morning, they come downstairs. There it is, scratched into the white oak floor. Get out. Some new owners pretend a friend has done it as a joke. Others are sure it's because they didn't tip the movers. A couple of nights later, a baby starts to cry from inside the north wall of the master bedroom. This is when they usually call. And this is the new owner on the phone. It's not what our hero, Helen Hoover Boyle, needs this morning. This stammering and whining. What she needs is a new cup of coffee and a seven-letter word for poultry. She needs to hear what's happening on the police scanner. Heaven, Helen Boyle snaps her fingers until her secretary looks in from the outer office. Our hero wraps both hands around the mouthpiece and points the telephone receiver at the scanner, saying, It's a code 911. And her secretary, Mona, shrugs and says, so? So she needs to look it up in the code book. And Mona says, relax, it's a shoplifter. Murders, suicides, serial killers, accidental overdoses. You can't wait until this stuff is on the front page of the newspaper. You can't let another agent beat you to the next rainmaker. Helen needs the new owner at 325 Crestwood Terrace to shut up for a minute. Of course, the message appears in the living room floor. What's odd is the baby doesn't usually start until the third night. First, the phantom message, then the baby cries all night. If the owners last long enough, they'll be calling in another week about the face that appears reflected in the water when you fill the bathtub a wadded up face of wrinkles, the eyes hollowed out dark holes. 
the third wink the third week brings the phantom shadows that circle around and around the dining room walls when everybody is seated at the table. There might be more events after that, but nobody's lasted a fourth week. To the new owner, Helen Hoover Boyle says, unless you're ready to go to court and prove the house is unlivable, unless you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the previous owners knew this was happening, she says, I have to tell you, she says, you lose a case like this after you generate all this bad publicity and that house will be worthless. It's not a bad house, 325 Crestwood Terrace, English Tudor, newer composition roof, four bedrooms, three and a half baths, an in-ground pool. Our hero doesn't even have to look at the fact sheet. She sold this house six times in the past two years. Another house, the New England Salt Box on Eaton Court, six bedrooms, four baths, pine paneled entryway, and blood running down the kitchen walls. She sold that house eight times in the past four years. To the new owner, she says, got to put you on hold for a minute. And she hits the red button. Helen, She's wearing a white suit and shoes, but not snow white. It's more of a white of downhill skiing in Banff with a private car and a driver on call. 14 pieces of matched luggage and a suite at the Hotel Lake Lewis, Lake Louise. To the doorway, our hero says, Mona, moonbeam. Louder, she says, spirit girl. She drums her pen against the folded newspaper page at her desk and says, what's a three letter word for rodent? The police scanner gargles words, mumbles and barks, repeating copy. After every line, repeating copy. Helen Boyle shouts, this coffee is not going to cut it. In another hour, she needs to be showing a Queen Anne, five bedrooms with a mother-in-law apartment two gas fireplaces in a face of a bar barbiturate suicide that appears late at night in the powder room mirror. After that, there's a split level ranch with FAG heat, a sunken conversion pit, and the reoccurring phantom gunshots of the double homicide that happened over a decade ago. This is all in her thick daily planner, thick and bound in what looks like red leather. This is her record of everything. She takes another sip of coffee and says, what do you call this? Swiss army mocha? Coffee is supposed to taste like coffee. Mona comes to the doorway with her arms folded across her front and says, what? And Helen says, I need you to swing by. She shuffles some fact sheets on her blotter. Swing by 4673 Wilmot Place. It's a Dutch colonial with a sunroom, four bedrooms, two baths, and an aggravated homicide. The police scanner says, copy? Just do the usual, Helen says, and she writes the address on a note card and holds it out. Don't resolve anything. Don't burn any sage. Don't exercise shit. Mona takes the note card and says, just check it for vibes. Helen slashes the air with her hand and says, I don't want anybody going down any tunnels toward any bright light. I want those freaks staying right here on this astral plane. Thank you. She looks at her newspaper and says, they have all eternity to be dead. They can hang around in that house another 50 years and rattle some chains. Helen Hoover Boyle looks at the blinking hold light and says, what did you pick up at the six bedroom Spanish yesterday? And Mona rolls her eyes at the ceiling. She pushes her jaw and blows a big sigh straight up to flop the hair on her forehead and says, there's a definite energy there, a subtle presence, but the floor plan is wonderful. A black silk cord loops around her neck and disappears into the corner of her mouth. And our hero says, screw the floor plan. Forget those dream houses you only sell once every 50 years. Forget those happy homes. 
and screw subtle, cold spots, strange vapors, irritable pets. What she needed was blood running down the walls. She needed ice cold, invisible hands that pulled children out of bed at night. She needed blazing red eyes in the dark at the foot of the basement stairs. That and decent curb appeal. The bungalow at 521 Elm Street, it has four bedrooms, original hardware and screams in the attic. The French Normandy at 7645 Western Heights has arched windows, a butler's pantry, leaded glass pocket doors, and a body that appears in the upstairs hallway with multiple stab wounds. The ranch style at 248 Levy Place, five bedrooms, four and a half baths with a brick patio. It has the reappearing blood coughed up on the master bathroom walls after a drain cleaner poisoning. Distressed houses, realtors call them. Those houses that never sold because no one liked to show them. No realtor wanted to host an open house there, risk spending any time there alone. Or those were the houses that sold and sold again every six months because nobody could live there. A good string of those houses 20 or 30 exclusives, and Helen could Helen can turn off the police scanner. She could quit searching the obituaries and the crime pages for suicides and homicides. She could stop sending Mona out to check on every possible lead. She could just kick back and find a five-letter word for equine. Plus, I need you to pick up my cleaning, she says, and get some decent coffee. She points her pen at Mona and says, and out of respect for professionalism, leave the little Rasta doohickeys at home. Mona pulls the black silk cord until the quartz crystal pops out of her mouth, shining and wet. She blows on it, saying, it's a crystal. My boyfriend Oyster gave it to me. And Helen says, you're dating a boy named Oyster? And Mona drops the crystal so it hangs against her chest and says, he says it's for my own protection. The crystal soaks a dark, darker wet spot on her orange blouse. Oh, and before you go, Helen says, get me Bill or Emily Burroughs on the phone. Helen presses the hold button and says, sorry about that. She says there are a couple of clear options here. The new owner can move, just sign a quit claim deed, and the house becomes the bank's problem. Or, our hero says, you give me a confidential exclusive to sell the house, what we call a vest pocket listing. And maybe the new owner says no this time, but after that hideous face appears between his legs in the bathwater, after the shadows start marching around the walls, well, everyone says yes eventually. On the phone, the new owner says, and you won't tell any buyers about the problem? And Helen says, don't even finish unpacking. We'll just tell people you're in the process of moving out. If anybody asks, tell them you're being transferred out of town. Tell them you loved this house. She says, everything else will just be our little secret. From the outer office, Mona says, I have Bill Burroughs on line too. And the police scanner says, copy. Our hero hits the next button and says, Bill. She mouths the words, coffee, at Mona. She jerks her head toward the window and mouths, go. The scanner says, do you copy? This was Helen Hoover Boyle, our hero, now dead, but not dead. Here was just another day in her life. This was the life she lived before I came along. Maybe this is a love story. Maybe not. It depends on how much I can believe myself. This is about Helen Hoover Boyle, her haunting me, the way a song stays in your head, the way you think life should be, how anything holds your attention, how your past goes with you into every day of your future. That is, this is. It's all of it, Helen Hoover Boyle. 
were all of us haunted and haunting. On this, the last ordinary day of her regular life, our hero says into the phone, Bill Burroughs, she says, you need to get Emily on the extension because I've just found you two, the perfect new home. She writes the word horse and says, it's my understanding that the sellers are very motivated. Chapter one. The problem with every story is you tell it after the fact. Even play-by-play -play description on the radio, the home runs and strikeouts, even that's delayed a few minutes. Even live television is postponed a couple of seconds. Even sound and light can only go so fast. Another problem is the teller, the who, what, where, when, and why of the reporter, the media bias, how the messenger shapes the facts, what journalists call the gatekeeper, how the presentation is everything. The story behind the story. Where I'm telling this from is one cafe after another. Where I'm writing this book chapter by chapter is never the same small town or city or truck stop in the middle of nowhere. What these places all have in common are miracles. You read about this stuff in the pulp tabloids, the kind of healings and sightings, the miracles that never get reported in the mainstream press. This week, it's Holy Virgin of Wellborn, New Mexico. She came flying down Main Street last week. Her long red and black dreadlocks whipping behind her, her bare feet dirty, she wore an Indian cotton skirt printed in two shades of brown and a denim halter top. It's all in this week's World Miracles Report, next to the cashier in every supermarket in America. And here I am, a week late, always one step behind, after the fact. The flying virgin had fingernails painted bright pink with white tips, a French manicure, some witnesses call it. The Flying Virgin used a can of Bug Off brand insect fogger, and across the blue New Mexican sky, she wrote, Stop having babies. The can of Bug Off she dropped. It's right now headed for the Vatican for analysis. Right now, you can buy postcards of the event, videos even. Almost everything you can buy is after the fact, caught, dead cooked. In the, souvenir in the souvenir videos, the flying virgin shakes the can of fogger, floating above one end of Main Street. She waves at the crowd, and there's a bush of brown hair under her arm. The moment before she starts riding, a gust of wind lifts her skirt, and the flying virgin's not wearing any panties. Between her legs, she's shaved. This is where I'm writing this story from today here in a roadside diner, talking to witnesses in Walburn, New Mexico. Here with me is Sarge, a baked potato of an old Irish cop. On the table between us is a local newspaper, folded to show a three-column ad that says, Attention, Patreons of all plush interiors furniture stores, the ad says. If poisonous spiders have hatched from your new unupholstered furniture, you may be eligible to take part in a class action lawsuit. And the ad gives a phone number you can call, but it's no use. The Sarge has the kind of, the kind of loose neck skin that if you pinch it, when you let go, the skin stays pinched. He has to go find a mirror and rub the skin to make it go flat. Outside the, dinner, outside the diner, people are still driving into town. People kneel and pray for another visitation. The Sarge puts his big mitts together and pretends to pray. His eyes rolled sideways to look out the window. His holster unsnapped, his pistol loaded and ready for skeet shooting. 
After she was done skywriting, the flying virgin blew kisses to people. She flashed a two-finger peace sign. She hovered just above the trees, clutching her skirt closed with one fist, and she shook her red and black dreadlocks back and waved an amen. She was gone behind the mountains, over the horizon, gone. Still, you can't trust everything you read in the newspaper. The Flying Madonna, it wasn't a miracle. It was magic. These aren't saints. They're spells. The Sarge and me, we're not here to witness anything. We're witch hunters. Still, this isn't a story about here and now. Me, the Sarge, the Flying Virgin, Helen Hoover Boyle. What I'm writing in this story of how we met, how we got here. Chapter two. I'm just going to take a drink. They might ask you just one question just before you graduate from journalism school. They tell you to imagine you're a reporter Imagine you work at a daily big city newspaper and one Christmas Eve, your editor sends you out to investigate a death. The police and paramedics are there. The neighbors wearing bathrobes and slippers crowd the hallway of the slummy tenement. Inside the apartment, a young couple is sobbing beside their Christmas tree. Their baby has choked to death on an ornament. You get what you need the baby's name and age and all. And you get back to the newspaper around midnight and write the story on press deadline. You submit it to your editor and he rejects it because you don't say the color of the ornament. Was it red or green? You couldn't look and you didn't think to ask. With the press room screaming for the front page, your choices are call the parents and ask the color or refuse to call and lose your job. This was a fourth estate, journalism. And where I went to school, just this one question is the entire final exam for the ethics course. It's an either or question. My answer was to call the paramedics. Items like this have to be cataloged. The ornament had to be bagged and photographed in some file of evidence. No way would I call the parents after midnight on Christmas Eve. The school gave my ethics a D. Instead of ethics, I learned only to tell people what they want to hear. I learned to write everything down and I learned editors can be real assholes. Since then, I still wonder what that test was really about. I'm a reporter now on a big city daily and I don't have to imagine anything. My first real baby was on a Monday morning in September. There was no Christmas ornament, no neighbors crowded around the trailer house in the the suburbs. One paramedic sat with the parents in the kitchenette and asked them the standard questions. The second paramedic took me back to the nursery and showed me what they usually find in the crib. The standard questions paramedics ask include who found the child dead, When was the child found? Was the child moved? When was the child last seen alive? Was the child breast or bottle fed? The questions seem random, but all doctors can do is gather statistics and hope someday a pattern will emerge. The nursery was yellow with blue flowered curtains at the windows and a white wicker chest of drawers next to the crib. There was a white painted rocking chair. Above the crib was a mobile of yellow plastic butterflies. On the wicker chest was a book open to page 27. On the floor was a blue braided rag rug. On one wall was a framed needlepoint. It said, Thursday's child has far to go. The room smelt like baby powder. And maybe I didn't learn ethics, but I learned to pay attention. No detail is too minor to note. The book open 
The open book was called Poems and Rhymes from Around the World, and it was checked out from the county library. My editor's plan was to do a five-part series on sudden infant death syndrome. Every year, 7,000 babies die without any apparent cause. Two out of every thousand babies will just go to sleep and never wake up. My editor, Duncan, he kept calling it crib death. The details about Duncan are he's pocked with acne, he's pocked with acne scars and his scalp is brown along the hairline every two weeks when he dyes his gray roots. His computer password is password. All we know about sudden infant death is there is no pattern. Most babies die along, alone between midnight and morning. Put a baby, but a baby will also die while, while sleeping beside its parents. It can die in a car seat or in a stroller. A baby can die in its mother's arms. There are so many people with infants, my editor said. It's the type of story that every parent or grandparent is too afraid to read and too afraid not to read. There's really no new information, but the idea was to profile five families that have lost a child. Show how people cope, how people can move forward with their lives. Here and there, we could salt in the standard facts about crib death. We could show the deep inner well of strength and compassion each of these people discovers. That angle because it ties to no specific event. It's what you call soft news. We'd run it on the front of the lifestyle section. For art, we could show smiling pictures of healthy babies that were now dead. We'd show how this could happen to anyone. That was his pitch. It's the kind of investigative piece you do for awards. It was late summer and the news was slow. This was the peak time of year for last term pregnancies and newborns. It was my editor's idea for me to tag along with paramedics. The Christmas story, the sobbing couple, the ornament. By now, I'd been working so long, I'd forgotten all that junk. That, that hypothetical ethics question, they have to ask that at the end of the journalism program. Because by then, it's too late. You have big student loans to pay off years and years later, I think. What are they really asking? What they're really asking is, is this something you want to do for a living? Chapter three. The muffled thunder of dialogue comes through the walls, then a chorus of laughter, then more thunder. Most of the laugh tracks on television were recorded in the early 1950s. These days, most of the people you hear laughing are dead. The stomp and stomp and stomp of a drum comes down through the ceiling. The rhythm changes. Maybe the beat crowds together faster or it spreads out slower, but it doesn't stop. Up through the floor, someone's barking the words to a song. These people who need their television or stereo or radio playing all the time. These people so scared of silence. These are my neighbors. These soundaholics, these quietophobics. Laughter of the dead comes through every wall. These days, this is what passes for home sweet home. This siege of noise. After work, I make one stop. The man standing behind the cash register looked up when I limped into the store. Still looking at me, he reached under the counter and brought up something in a paper bag saying, double bagged, I think you'll like this one. He set it on the counter and patted it with one hand. The package is half the size of a shoebox. It weighs less than one can of tuna. He pressed one, two, three buttons on the register and the price window said $149. He told me, just so you won't worry, I taped the bag shut tight. In case it rains, he put the package in a plastic bag and said, you let me know if there's any of it not there, he said. 
you don't walk like that foot is getting better. All the way home, the package rattled under my arm. The brown paper slid and wrinkled with every limp. What's inside, what's inside clattered from one end of the box to the other. At my apartment, the ceiling is pounding with some fast music. The walls are murmuring with panicked voices. Either an ancient cursed Egyptian mummy has come back to life and is trying to kill the people next door or they're watching a movie. Under the floor, there's, some, there's someone shouting, a dog barking, doors slamming, the auctioneer call of some song. In the bathroom, I turn out the lights so I can't see what's in the bag, so I won't know how it's supposed to turn out. In the cramped, tight darkness, I stuff a towel in the crack under the door. With the package on my lap, I sit on the toilet and listen. This is what passes for civilization. People who would never throw litter from their car will drive past you with their radio blaring. People who'd never blow cigar smoke at you in a crowded restaurant will bellow into their cell phone. They'll shout at each other across the space of a dinner plate. These people who would never spray herbicides or incesticides will fog the neighborhood with their stereo playing Scottish bagpipe music, Chinese opera, country and Western. Outdoors, a bird singing is fine. Patsy Cline is not. Outdoors, the din of traffic is bad enough. Adding Chopin's piano concerto in E minor is not making any situation better. You churn up your music to hide the noise. Other people churn up their music to hide yours. You churn up yours again. Everyone buys a bigger stereo system. This is the arms race of sound. You don't win with a lot of trouble. This isn't about quality, it's about volume. This isn't about music, it's about winning. You stomp the competition with the bass line. You rattle windows. You drop the melody line and shout the lyrics. You put in foul language and come down hard on each cuss word. You dominate. This is really about power. In the dark bathroom, Sitting on the toilet, I fingernail the tape open at one end of the package, and what's inside is a square cardboard box, smooth, soft, and furred at the edges, each corner blunt and crushed in. The top lifts off, and what's inside feels like layers of sharp, hard, complicated shapes, tiny angles, curves, corners and points. These I set to one side on the bathroom floor in the dark. The cardboard box I put back inside the paper bags. Between the hard tangled shapes are two sheets of slippery paper. These papers I put in the bags too. The bags I crush and roll and twist into a ball. All of this I do blind touching the smooth paper, feeling the layers of hard branching shapes. The floor under my shoes, even the toilet seat shakes a little from the music next door. Each family with a crib death, you wanna tell them to take up a hobby. You'd be surprised just how fast you can close the door on your past. No matter how bad things get, you can still walk away learn needlepoint, make a stained glass lamp. I carry the shapes into the kitchen. And in the light, they're blue and gray and white. They're brittle, hard plastic, just tiny shards, tiny shingles and shutters and barge boards, tiny steps and columns and window frames. If it's a house or a hospital, you can't tell. There are little brick walls and little doors, 
spread out on the kitchen table. It could be the parts of a school or church. Without seeing the picture on the box, without the instruction sheets, the tiny gutters and dormers might be for a train station or a lunatic asylum, a factory, or a prison. No matter how you put it together, you're never sure if it's right. The little pieces, the cupolas and chimneys, they twitch with each beat of noise coming through the floor. These musicaholics, these comophobics. No one wants to admit we're addicted to music. That's just not possible. No one's addicted to music and television and radio. We just need more of it, more channels, a larger screen, more volume. We can't bear to be without it, but no, nobody's addicted. We can turn it off at any time we wanted. I fit a window frame into a brick wall with a little brush the size for a fingernail polish. I glue it. The window is the size of a fingernail. The glue smells like hairspray. The smell tastes like oranges and gasoline. The pattern of the bricks on the wall is as fine as your fingerprint. Another window fits into place and I brush on more glue. The sound shivers through the walls, through the table, through the window frame and into my finger. These distractionaholics, these focusophobics, old George Orwell got it backward. Big Brother isn't watching. He's singing and dancing. He's pulling rabbits out of a hat. Big Brother's busy holding your attention every moment you're awake. He's making sure you're always distracted. He's making sure you're fully absorbed. He's making sure your imagination withers until it's, a use, until it's as useful as your appendix. He's making sure your attention is always filled. And with this being fed, it's worse than being watched. With the world always filling you, no one has to worry about what's in your mind. With everyone's imagination atrophied, no one will be ever be a threat to the world. I finger open a button on my white shirt and stuff my tie inside. With my chin tucked down against the knot of my tie, I tweezer a tiny pane of glass into each window. Using a razor blade, I cut plastic curtains smaller than a postage stamp. Blue curtains for the upstairs, yellow for the downstairs. Some curtains left open, some drawn shut. I glue them down. There are worse things than finding your wife and child dead. You can watch the world do it. You can watch your wife get old and bored. You can watch your kids discover everything in the world you've tried to save them from. Drugs, divorce, conformity, disease. All the nice, clean books, music, television, distraction. These people with a dead child, you want to tell them to go ahead, blame yourself. There are worse things you can do with the people you love than kill them. The regular way is just to watch the world do it. Just read the newspaper. The music and laughter eat away at your thoughts. The noise blots them out. All the sound distracts. Your head aches from the glue. Anymore, no one's mind is their own. You can't concentrate. You can't think. There's always some noise worming in. Singers shouting. Dead people laughing. Actors crying. All these little doses of emotion. Someone's always spraying the air with their mood their car stereo, broadcasting their grief or joy or anger all over the neighborhood.
one Dutch colonial mansion, I installed 56 windows upside down and had to throw it out. One 12 bedroom Tudor castle, I glued the down spots and down spouts in the wrong gable ends and melted everything by trying to fix it with a chemical solvent. This isn't anything new. Experts in ancient Greek culture say that people back then didn't see their thoughts as belonging to them. When ancient Greeks had a thought, it occurred to them as a god or goddess giving an order. Apollo was telling them to be brave. Athena was telling them to fall in love. Now people hear a commercial for sour cream potato chips and rush out to buy, but now they call this free will. Now people hear a commercial. Oh, I just said that. At least the ancient Greeks were being honest. The truth is, even if you read to your wife and child some night, you read them a lullaby, the next morning you wake up, but your family doesn't. You lie in bed, still curled against your wife. She's still warm, but not breathing. Your daughter's not crying. The house is already hectic with traffic and talk radio and steam pounding through the pipes inside the walls. The truth is, you can forget even that day for a moment. It takes to make a perfect knot in your tie. This I know. This is my life. You might move away, but that's not enough. You'll take up a hobby. You'll bury yourself in work, change your name. You'll cobble things together, make order out of chaos. You'll do this each time your foot is healed enough and you have the money. Organize every detail. This isn't what a therapist will tell you to do, but it works. You glue the doors into the walls next. You glue the walls into the foundation. You tweezer together the tiny bits of chimney and let the glue dry while you build the roof. You hang the tiny gutters. Every detail exact. You set the tiny dormers, hang the shutters, frame the porch, seed the lawn, plant the trees. Inhale the taste of oranges and gasoline, the smell of hairspray. Lose yourself in each complication. Glue a thread of ivy up one side of the chimney. Your fingers webbed with threads of glue. Your fingertips crusted and sticking together. You tell yourself that noise is what defines silence. Without noise, silence would not be golden. Noise is the exception. Think of deep outer space, the incredible cold and quiet where your wife and kid wait. Silence, not heaven, would be reward enough. With tweezers, you plant flowers along the foundation. Your back and neck curve forward over the table. With your ass clenched, your spines hunched, arching up to a headache at the base of your skull. You glue the tiny welcome mat outside the front door. You hook up the tiny lights inside. You glue the mailbox beside the front door. You glue the tiny, tiny milk bottles on the front porch with the tiny folded newspaper. Everything perfect, exact, meticulous. It must be three or four in the morning because by now it's quiet. The floor, the ceiling, the walls are still. The compressor on the refrigerator shuts off. And you can hear the filament buzzing in each light bulb. You can hear my, match tick, my watch tick. A moth knocks against the kitchen window. You can see your breath. The room is that cold. You put the batteries in place and flip a little switch and the tiny windows glow. You set the house on the floor and you churn out the kitchen light. Stand over the house in the dark. From this far away, it looks perfect, perfect and safe and happy. A neat red brick home. The tiny windows of light shine out from the lawn and trees. The curtains glow. 
yellow in the baby's room, blue in your own bedroom. The trick to forgetting the big picture is to look at everything close up. The shortcut to closing a door is to bury yourself in the details. This is how we must look to God. As if everything's just fine. Now take off your shoe and with your bare foot stomp. Stomp and keep stomping. No matter how much it hurts, the brittle broken plastic and wood and glass keep stomping until the downstairs neighbor pounds the ceiling with his fists. Chapter four. My second crib death assignment is in a concrete block housing project on the edge of downtown. The deceased slumped in a high chair in the middle of the afternoon while the babysitter cried in the bedroom. The high chair was in the kitchen. Dirty dishes were piled in the sink. Back in the city room, Duncan, my editor, says, single or double sink? Another detail about Duncan is when he talks, he spits. Double, I tell him. Stainless steel. Separate hot and cold knobs. Pistol grip style with porcelain handles. No spray nozzle. And Duncan says, the model of the, of the refrigerator, little spits of his saliva flash in the office lights. Amana, I say. They have a calendar, little touches of Duncan's spit. Spray my hand, my arm, the side of my face. The spit's cold from the air conditioning. The calendar had a painting of an old mill, I tell him, the water wheel kind, sent out by an insurance agent, written on it was the baby's next appointment at the pediatrician and the mother's upcoming GED exam. These dates and times in the pediatrician's name are all in my notes. And Duncan says, damn, you're good. His spits drying on my skin and lips. The kitchen floor was gray linoleum. The countertops were pink with black cigarette burns creeping in from the edge. On the counter next to the sink was a library book, poems and rhymes from around the world. The book was shut and when I set it on its spine, when I let it fall open by itself, hoping it would show how far the reader had cracked the binding, the pages fluttered open to page 27, and I make a pencil mark in the margin. My editor closes one eye and tilts his head at me. What? He says. What kind of food dried on the dishes? Spaghetti, I say. Canned sauce, the kind with extra mushrooms and garlic. I inventoried the garbage in the bag under the sink. 200 milligrams of salt per serving, 150 calories of fat. I don't know what I ever expect to find, but like everybody at the scene, it pays to look for a pattern. Duncan says, you see this? And hands me a proof sheet from today's restaurant section. Above the fold, there's an advertisement. It's three columns wide by six inches deep. The top line says, attention, Patreons of Treeline Dining Club. The body copy says, have you contracted a treatment resistant form of chronic fatigue syndrome after eating in this establishment? Has this foodborne virus left you unable to work and live a normal life? If so, please call the following number to be part of a class action lawsuit. Then there's a phone number with a weird prefix, maybe a cell phone. Duncan says, you think there's a story here? and the pages dotted with his spit. Here in the city room, my pager starts to beep. It's the paramedics. In journalism school, what they want you to be is a camera, a trained, objective, detached professional, accurate, polished, and observant. What 
They want you to believe that the news and you are always two separate things. Killers and reporters are mutually exclusive. Whatever the story, this isn't about you. My third baby is in a farmhouse two hours downstate. My fourth baby is in a condo near a shopping mall. One paramedic leads me to the back bedroom saying, sorry, we called you out on this one. His name is John Nash, and he pulls the sheet off the child in bed, a little boy, too perfect, too peaceful, too white to be asleep. Nash says, this one's almost six years old. The details about Nash are, he's a big guy in a white uniform. He wears high top white track shoes and gathers his hair into a little palm tree at the crown of his head. We could be working in Hollywood, Nash says. With this kind of clean, bloodless death, there's no death agonies, no reverse peristalsis. The death throes where your digestive system works backwards and you vomit fecal matter. You start puking shit, Nash says, and there's a realistic type of death scene. What he tells me about crib death is that it occurs most between two and four months after birth. Over 90% of deaths occur before six months. Most, re most researchers say that beyond 10 months, it's almost impossible. Beyond a year old, the medical examiner calls the de cause of death undetermined. A second death of this nature in a family is considered homicide until proven otherwise. In the condo, the bedroom walls are painted green. The bed has flannel sheets printed with Scotch, Scotch terriers. All you can smell is an aquarium full of lizards. When someone presses a pillow over the face of a child, the medical examiner calls this gentle homicide. My fifth dead child is in a hotel room out by the airport. With the farmhouse and the condo, there's a book, Poems and Rhymes, open to page 27. Oh, dang. Sorry, guys, he's having a nightmare. Oh, dang. Good boy. The same book from the county library with my pencil mark in the margin. In the hotel room, there's no book. It's a double room with a baby curled up in a queen size bed next to the bed where the parents slept. There's a color television in an armoire, a, 30 in, a 36 inch Zenith with 56 cable channels and four local. The carpet's brown, the curtains brown with blue florals. On the bathroom floor is a wet towel spot, spotted with blood and green shaving gel. Somebody didn't flush the toilet. The bedspreads are dark blue and smell like cigarette smoke. There's no books anywhere. I ask if the family has removed anything from the scene and the officer at the scene says no, but somebody from social services came by to pick up some clothes. Oh, he says, and some library books that were past due. Chapter five. The front door swings open and inside is a woman holding a cell phone to her ear, smiling at me and talking to somebody else. Mona, she says into the phone, you'll have to make this quick. Mr. Strenner's just arrived. She shows me the back of her free hand, the tiny sparkling watch on her wrist and says, he's a few minutes early. Her other hand, her long pink fingernails with the tips painted white with her little black cell phone, these are almost lost in the shining pink clouds of her hair. Smiling, she says, relax, Mona, and her eyes go up and down me. Brown sport coat, she says, brown slacks, white shirt. She frowns and winces, and a blue tie. The woman tells the phone, middle-aged, 
510, maybe 170 pounds, Caucasian, brown, green. She winks at me and says, his hair's a little messy and he didn't shave today, but he looks harmless enough. She leans forward a little and mouths, my secretary. Into the phone, she says, what? She steps inside and waves me in the door with her free hand. She rolls her eyes until they come around and meet mine and says, Thank you for your concern, Mona, but I don't think Mr. Strenner is here to rape me. Ooh, I shouldn't have said that word. Um, where we're at is the Gartroller Estate on Walker Ridge Drive, a Georgianian-style eight-bedroom house with seven bathrooms, four fireplaces, a breakfast room, a formal dining room, and a 1,500-square-foot ballroom on the fourth floor. It has a separate six-car garage and a guest house. It has an in-ground swimming pool and a fire and intruder alarm system. Walker Ridge Drive is the kind of neighborhood where they pick up the garbage five days a week. These are the kind of people who appreciate the threat of a good lawsuit. And when you stop by to introduce yourself, they smile and agree. The guard troller estate is beautiful. These neighbors won't ask you to come inside. They'll stand in their half open front doors and smile. They'll tell you they really don't know anything about the history of the guard troller house. It's a house. If you ask any more, people will glance over your shoulder at your empty street and they'll smile again and say, I can't help you. You really need to call the realtor. The sign at 3465 Walker Ridge Drive says Boyle Realty, shown by appointment only. At another house, a woman in a maid's uniform answered the door with a little five or six-year-old girl looking out from behind the maid's black skirt. The maid shook her head, saying she didn't know anything. You'll have to call the listing agent, she said. Helen Boyle, it's on the sign. And the little girl said, she's a witch. And the maid closed the door. Now inside the guard troller house, Helen Hoover Boyle walks through the echoing white empty rooms. She's still on her phone as she walks. Her cloud of pink hair, her fitted pink suit, her legs in white stockings, her feet in pink, medium heels. Her lips are gummy with pink lipstick. Her arms sparkle and rattle with gold and pink bracelets, gold chains, charms, and coins. Enough ornaments for a Christmas tree, pearls big enough to choke a horse. Into the phone, she says. Did you call the police in the executor house? They should have run screaming out of there two weeks ago. She walks through tall double doors into the next room, then the next. Uh-huh, she says. What do you mean they're not living there? Tall arched windows look out to the stone terrace. Beyond that is a lawn striped with lawnmower tracks. Beyond that, a swimming pool. Into the phone, she says. You don't spend half a million, two, on a house and then not live there. Her voice is loud and sharp in these rooms without furniture or carpets. A small pink and white purse hangs from a long gold chain looped over her shoulder. Five foot six, 118 pounds. It would be hard to peg her age. She's so thin she must be either dying or rich. Her suit's some kind of nubby sofa fabric edged with white braid. It's pink, but not shrimp pink. It's more the color of shrimp pate served on a water cracker with a sprig of parsley and a dollop of caviar. The jacket is tailored tight at her pinched waist and padded square at her shoulders. The skirt is shorter and snug. The gold buttons, huge. She's wearing doll clothes. No, she says, Mr. Strenner's right here. She lifts her penciled eyebrows and looks at me. Am I wasting his time, she says? I hope not. 
Smiling, she tells the phone, good. He's shaking his head, no. I have to wonder about, I have to wonder what about me made her say middle-aged. To tell the truth, I say, I'm not really in the market for a house. With two pink fingernails over the cell phone, she leans toward me and mouths, just one more minute. The truth is, I say, I got her name off some records at the county coroner's office. The truth is, I've poured over the forensic records for every local crib death within the past 25 years. And still listening to the phone without looking at me, she puts the pink fingernails of her free hand against my lapel and keeps them there, pushing just a little. Into the phone, she says, so what's the problem? Why aren't they living there? Judging from her hand, this close up, she must be in her late 30s or early 40s. Still, this taxidermied look that passes for beauty above a certain age and income, it's too old for her. Her skin already looks exfoliated, plucked, scruffed, moisturized, and made up until she could be a piece of refurnished furniture. Reupholstered in pink, a restoration, renovated. Into her cell phone, she shouts, you're joking. Yes, of course I know what a teardown is, she says. That's a historic house. Her shoulders draw up, tight against each side of her neck, and then drop. Turning her face away from the phone, she sighs with her eyes closed. She listens, standing there with her pink shoes and white legs mirrored upside down in the dark wood floor. Reflected deep in the wood, you can see the shadows inside her skirt. With her free hand cupped over her forehead, she says, Mona, she says, we cannot afford to lose that listing. If they replace that house, chances are it will be off the market for good. Then she's quiet again, listening. And I have to wonder, since when can't you hear a blue since when can't you wear a blue tie with a brown coat? I duck my head to meet her eyes saying, Mrs. Boyle, I needed to see her someplace private outside her office. It's about a story I'm researching. But she waves her fingers between us. In another second, she walks over to the fireplace and leans into it, bracing her free hand against the mantle, whispering, when the wrecking ball swings, the neighbors will probably stand and cheer. The wide doorway opens from this room into another white room with wood floors and a complicated carved ceiling painted white. In another direction, a doorway opens on a room lined with empty white bookshelves. Maybe we could start a protest, she says. We could write some letters to the newspaper. And I say, I'm from the newspaper. Her perfume is the smell of leather car seats and old wilted roses and cedar chest lining. And Helen Hoover Boyle says, Mona, hold on. And walking back to me, she says, what were you saying, Mr. Strenner? Her eyelashes blink once, twice, fast, waiting. Her eyes are blue. I'm a reporter from the newspaper. The Exeter house is a lovely, historic house. Some people want to tear down, she says, with one hand cupped over her phone. Seven bedrooms, 6,000 square feet, all cherry paneling throughout the first floor. The empty room is so quiet, you can hear a tiny voice on the telephone saying, Helen? Closing her eyes, she says, it was built in 1935, and she tilts her head back. It has radiant stream heat. It has radiant steam heat. 2.8 acres, a tile roof. And the tiny voice says, Helen, a game room, she says, a wet bar, a home gym room. The problem is I don't have this much time. All I need to know, I say, is did you ever have a child? A butler's pantry, she says. A walk-in refrigerator. I say, did her son die of crib death about 25 years ago? Her eyelashes blink once, twice, and she says, 
pardon me? I need to know if she read out loud to her son. His name was Patrick. I want to find all existing copies of a certain book. Holding her phone between her ear and the padded shoulder of her jacket, Helen Boyle snaps open her pink and white purse and takes out a pair of white gloves. Flexing her fingers into each glove, she says, Mona, I need to know if she might still have a copy of this particular book. I'm sorry, but I can't tell her why. She says, I'm afraid Mr. Strenner will, no, will be of no use to us. I need to know if they did an autopsy on her son. To me, she smiles. Then she mouths the words, get out. And I raise both my hands, spread open toward her and start backing away. I just need to make sure every copy of this book is destroyed. And she says, Mona, please call the police. Chapter six. In crib deaths, it's standard procedure to assure the parents that they've done nothing wrong. Babies do not smother in their blankets. In the journal of Journal of Pediatrics in a study published in 1945 called Medical Suffocation During Infancy, researchers proved that no baby could smother in bedding. Even the smallest baby, placed face down on a pillow or mattress, could roll enough to breathe. Even if the child had a slight cold, there's no proof that it's related to the death. There's no proof to link DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, inoculations, and sudden death. Even if the child had been to the doctor hours before, it still might die. A cat does not sit on a child and suck out its life. All we know is we don't know. Nash, the paramedic, shows me the purple and red bruises on every child, liver mortis, where the, oxen, where the oxygen, oxygenated hemoglobin settles at the lowest part of the body. The bloody froth leaking from the nose and mouth is what the medical examiner calls purge fluids, a natural part of decomposition. People desperate for an answer will look at liver mortis, at purge fluids, even at diaper rash and assume child abuse. The trick to forgetting the big picture is to look at everything close up. The shortcut to closing any door is to bury yourself in the little details, the facts. The best part of becoming a reporter is you can hide behind your notebook. Everything is always research. At the county library in the juvenile section, the book is back on the shelf, waiting. Poems and rhymes from around the world. And on page 27, there's a poem, a traditional African poem, the book says. It's eight lines long, and I don't need to copy it. I have it in my notes from the very first baby, the trailer house in the suburbs. I tear out the page and put the, back, put the book back on the shelf. In the city room, Duncan says, how's it going on the dead baby beat? He says, I need you to call this number and see what's what. And he hands me a proof sheet from the lifestyle section and ad circled in red pen. Three columns by six inches deep, the copy says. Attention, patrons of the Meadow Downs Fitness and Racket Club. It says, have you contracted a flesh-eating fungal infection from the fitness equipment or personal contact surfaces in the restrooms? If so, please call the following number to be part of a class action lawsuit. At the phone number in question, a man's voice answers. Deemer, Duke, and Diller, attorneys at law. The man says, we'll need your name and address for record. Over the phone, he says, can you describe your rash, size, location, color, tissue loss or damage? Be as specific as possible. There's been a mistake, I say. There's no rash, I say. I'm not calling to be in the lawsuit. For whatever reason, Helen Hoover Boyle comes to mind. When I say I'm a reporter for the newspaper, the man says, 
I'm sorry, but we're not allowed to discuss the matter until a lawsuit is filed. I call the racket club, but they won't talk either. I call the treeline dining club from the earlier ad, but they won't talk. The phone numbers in both ads are the same one with the weird cell phone prefix. I call it again and the man's voice says, Diller, Doom and Duke, attorneys at law, and I hang up. In journalism school, they teach you to start with your most important fact, the inverted pyramid, they call it. Put the who, what, where, when, and why at the top of the article. Then list the lesser facts in descending order. That way, an editor can lop off any length of the story without losing anything too important. All the little details, the smell of the bread, the bedspread, the food on the plates, the color of the Christmas tree ornament. That stuff always gets left on the composing room full floor. The only pattern in crib death is it tends to increase as the weather cools in the fall. This is a fact my editor wants to lead with in our first installment. Something to panic people. Five babies, five installments. This way, we can keep people reading the series for five consecutive Sundays. We can promise to explore the causes and patterns of sudden infant death. We can hold out hope. Some people still think knowledge is power. We can guarantee advertisers a highly invested readership. Outside, it's colder already. Back at City Room, I ask my editor, do me a little favor. I think maybe I found a pattern. It looks as if every parent might have read the same poem out loud to their child the night before it died. All five, he says. I say, let's try a little experiment. This is late in the evening and we're both tired from a long day. We're sitting in his office and I tell him to listen. It's an old song about animals going to sleep. It's wistful and sentimental. And my face feels livid and hot with oxen with oxygen genated hemoglobin while I read the poem out loud under the fluorescent lights. Across the desk from my editor with his tie undone and his collar open, leaning back in his chair with his eyes closed. His mouth is open a little. His teeth and his coffee mug are stained the same brown coffee, the same coffee brown. What's good is we're alone and it only takes a minute. At the end, he opens his eyes and says, what the fuck was that supposed to mean? Duncan, his eyes are green. His spit lands in little cold specks on my arm, bringing germs, little wet buckshot, bringing viruses, brown coffee saliva. And I say, I don't know. The book calls it a culling song. In some ancient cultures, they sang it to children during famines or droughts. Any time a tribe had outgrown its land, you sing it to warriors crippled in battle and people stricken with disease. Anyone you hope will die soon to end their pain. It's a lullaby. As far as ethics, what I've learned is a journalist, journalist's job isn't to judge the facts. Your job isn't to screen information. Your job is to collect the details. Just what's there. Be an impartial witness. What I know now is someday you won't think twice about calling those parents back on Christmas Eve. Duncan looks at his watch, then at me and says, So what's your experiment? Tomorrow I'll know if there's a casual relationship a real pattern. It's just my job to tell a story. I put page 27 through his paper shredder. Stick and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. I don't want to explain until I know for sure. This is still a hypothetical situation. So I ask my editor to humor me. I say, 
We both need some rest, Duncan. I say, maybe we can talk about it in the morning. Chapter 7 During my first cup of coffee, Henderson walks over from the national desk. Some people grab their coats and head for the elevator. Some grab a magazine and head for the bathroom. Other people duck behind their computer screens and pretend to be on the phone while Henderson stands in the center of the newsroom with his tie loose around his open collar and shouts, Where the hell is Duncan? He yells, The street edition is going to press and we need the rest of the damn front page. Some people just shrug. I pick up my phone. The details about Henderson are he's got blonde hair combed across his forehead. He dropped out of law school. He's an editor on the national desk. He always knows the snow conditions and has a lift pass dangling from every coat he owns. His computer password is password. Standing next to my desk, he says, Strediter, is that nasty blue tie the only one you got? Holding the phone to my ear, I mouth the word interview. I ask the dial tone, is that B as in boy? Of course, I'm not telling anybody about how I read Duncan the poem. I can't call the police. About my theory, I can't explain to Heaven Hoover Boyle why I need to ask her about her dead son. My collar feels so tight, I have to swallow hard and force any coffee down. Even if people believed me, the first thing they'd want to know is, what poem? Show it to us. Prove it. The question isn't, would the poem leak out? The question is, how soon would the human race be extinct? Here's the power of life and a cold, clean, bloodless, easy death available to anyone, to everyone, an instant, bloodless, Hollywood death. Even if I don't tell, how long until poems and rhymes from around the world gets into a classroom? How long until page 27, the calling song, gets read to 50 kids before nap time? How long until it's read over the radio to thousands of people until it's set to music, translated into other languages? Hell, it doesn't even have to be translated to work. Babies don't speak any language. No one's seen Duncan for three days. Miller thinks Klein called Duncan at home. Klein thinks Fillmore called. Everybody's sure somebody else called. But nobody's talked to Duncan. He hasn't answered his email. Carruthers says Duncan didn't bother to call in sick. Another cup of coffee later. Another cup of coffee later. Henderson stops by my desk with the tear sheet from the leisure section. It's folded to show an ad. Three columns by six inches deep. Henderson looks at me tapping my watch and holding it to my ear. He says, you see this in the morning edition? The ad says, attention, first class passengers of Regent Pacific Airlines. The ad says, have you suffered hair loss and or discomfort from crab lice after coming in contact with airline upholstery, pillows or blankets? If so, please call the following number to be part of a class action lawsuit. Henderson says, you called about this yet? I say, maybe he should just shut up and call. And Henderson says, you're Mr. Special Features. He says, this isn't prison. I ain't your bitch. This is killing me. You don't become a reporter because you're good at keeping secrets. Being a journalist is about telling. It's about bearing the bad news, spreading the contagion. The biggest story in history. This could be the end of mass media. The culling song should be would be a plague unique to the information age. 
Imagine a world where people shun the television, the radio, movies, the internet, magazines, and newspapers. People have to wear earplugs the way they wear condoms or rubber, rubber gloves. In the past, nobody worried too much about sex with strangers. Or before that, bites from fleas or untreated drinking water, mosquitoes, asbestos. Imagine a plague you catch through your ears. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but now words can kill too. The new death, this plague, can come from anywhere. A song, an overheard announcement, a news bulletin, a sermon, a street musician. You can catch death from a telemarketer, a teacher, an internet file, a birthday card, a fortune cookie. A million people might watch a televised show, then be dead the next morning because of an advertising jingle. Imagine the panic. Imagine a new dark age. Exploration, the trade routes brought the first plagues from China to Europe. With mass media, we have so many means, new means of transmission. Imagine the books burning and tapes and films and files, radios and television will all go into that same bonfire. All those libraries and bookstores blazing away in the night, people will attack microwave relay stations, people with axes will chop every fiber optic cable. Imagine people chanting prayers, singing hymns to drown out any sound that might bring death, their hands clamped over their ears. Imagine people shunning any song or speech where death could be coded the way maniacs would poison a bottle of aspirin. Any new word. Anything they don't already understand will be suspect, dangerous, avoided, a quarantine against communication. And if this was a death spell, an incantation, there had to be others. If I know about page 27, someone else must. I'm not the pi pioneer brain of anything. How long until someone dissects the calling song and creates another variation and another and another? All of them new and improved until Oppenheimer invented the atom bomb. It was impossible. Now we have the atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb and the neutron bomb, and people are still expanding on that one idea. We're forced into a new scary paradigm. If Duncan's dead, he was a necessary casualty. He was my atmospheric nuclear test. He was my trinity, my Hiroshima. Still, Palmer from the copy desk is sure Duncan's in composing. Jenkins from composing says Duncan's probably in the art department. Howley from art says he's in the clipping library. Shop from the library says Duncan's at the copy desk. Around here, this is what passes for reality. The kind of security they now have at airports. Imagine that kind of crackdown at all libraries, schools, theaters, bookstores, after the culling song leaks out. Anywhere information might be disseminated, you'll find armed guards. The airwaves will be as empty as a public swimming pool during a polio scare. After that, only a few government broadcasts will air. Only well-scrubbed news and music. After that, any music, books, and movies will be tested on lab animals or volunteer convicts before release to the public. Instead of surgical masks, people will, people will wear earphones that will give them soothing, constant protection of safe music or bird songs. 
people will pay for a supply of pure news, a source for safe information and entertainment. The way milk and meat and blood are inspected, imagine books and music and movies being filtered and certified, approved for consumption. People will be happy to give up most of their culture for the assurance that the tiny bit that comes through is safe and clean. White noise. Imagine a world of silence where any loud sound, where any sound loud enough or long enough to harbor a deadly poem would be banned. No more motorcycles, lawnmowers, jet planes, electric blenders, hair dryers. A world where people are afraid to listen, afraid they'll hear something behind the din of traffic, some toxic words buried in the loud music playing next door. Imagine a higher and higher resistance to language. No one talks because no one dares to listen. The deaf shall inherit the earth. And the illiterate, the isolated. Imagine a world of hermits. Another cup of coffee and I have to piss like a bastard. Henderson from National catches me washing my hands in the men's room and says something. It could be anything. Drawing my hands under the blower. I yell I can't hear him. Duncan, Henderson yells over the sound of the water and hand dryer. He yells, we have two dead bodies in a hotel suite and we don't know if it's news or not. We need Duncan to make a call. I guess that's what he says. There's so much noise. In the mirror, I check my tie and finger comb my hair. In one breath with Henderson reflected next to me, I could race through the culling song and I'd be and he'd be out of my life by tonight. Him and Duncan, dead. It would be that easy. Instead, I ask if it's okay to wear a blue tie with a brown jacket. Chapter 8. When the first paramedic arrived at the scene, the first action he took was to call his stockbroker. This paramedic, my friend John Nash, sized up the situation in suite 17F of the Pressman Hotel and put in a sell order for all his shares of Stuart Western Technologies. They can fire me, okay, Nash says, but in the three minutes that I made that call, those two in the bed weren't getting any debtor. The next call he makes is to me, asking if, I, if I've got 50 bucks for him to find out a few extra facts. He says if I got shares of Stuart Western to dump them and then get my ass over to this bar on 3rd near the hospital. Christ, Nash says over the phone. This woman has this woman was beautiful. If Turner hadn't been there, Turner my partner, I don't know. And he hangs up. According to the ticker, shares of the Stuart Western tech are already sliding into the toilet. Already the news must be out about Baker Lewis Stewart, the company's founder and his new wife, Penny Price Stewart. Last night, the Stewarts had dinner at seven o'clock at Chez Chef. This is all easy enough to bribe out of the hotel con con conciliaire. According to their waiter, one had the salmon risotto, the other had portobello mushrooms. Looking at the check, he said, you can't tell who had what. They drank a bottle of Pinot Noir. Somebody had cheesecake for dessert. Both of them had coffee. At nine, they drove to an after-hours party at the Chambers Gallery, where witnesses told police the couple talked to several people, including the gallery owner and the architect of their new house. They each had another glass of some jug wine. At 10.30, they returned to the Pressman Hotel, where they'd been staying in Suite 17F for almost a month since their wedding. The, ho the hotel operator says they made several phone calls between 10.30 and midnight. At 12.15, they called the front desk and asked for an 8 o'clock wake-up call. The desk clerk confirms that they used the television remote control to order a pornographic movie. 
At nine the next morning, the maid found them dead. Embolism, if you ask me, Nash says. You eat a girl out and you blow some air inside her, or if you fuck her too hard, either way, you can force air into her bloodstream and the bubble goes right to her heart. Nash is heavy, a big guy wearing a heavy coat over his white uniform. He's wearing his white track shoes and standing at the bar when I get there. Both elbows on the bar. He's eating a steak sandwich on a Kaiser roll with mustard and mayo squeezing out at the far end. He's drinking a cup of black coffee. His greasy hair is pulled into the black palm tree on top of his head. And I say, so? I ask, was the place ransacked? Nash is just chewing, his big jaw going around and around. He holds the sandwich in both hands, but starts, stares past it at the plate full of mess, dill pickles and potato chips. I ask, did he smell anything in the hotel room? He says, newlyweds like they were. I figured he fucks her to death and then has himself a heart attack. Five bucks says they open her and find air in her heart. I ask, did he at least star 69 their telephone to find out who'd called last? And Nash says, no can do, not on a, t on a hotel phone. I say, I want more for my 50 bucks than just his drooling over a dead body. You'd have been drooling too, he says. Damn, she was a looker. I ask, were there valuables, watches, wallets, jewelry left at the scene? He says, still warm too, under the covers. Warm enough. No death agonies, nothing. His big jaw goes around and around, slower now as he stares down at nothing in particular. If you could have any woman you wanted, he says, if you could have, if you could have her any way you would wanted, wouldn't you do it? I say, what's he's what he's talking about is rape. Not, he says, if she's dead, and he crunches down on a potato chip in his mouth. If I'd been alone, alone, and had a rubber, he says through his food. No way would I let the medical examiner find my DNA at the scene. Then he's talking about murder. Not if somebody else kills her, Nash says, and looks at me, or kills him. The husband had a fine-looking ass, if that's what floats your boat. No leakage, no liver mortis, no skin slippage, nothing. How can he talk this way and still eat? I don't know. He says, both of them naked, a big wet spot on the mattress right between them. Yeah, they did it. Did it and died. Nash chews his sandwich and says, seeing her there, she was better looking than any piece of tail I've ever had. If Nash knew the culling song, there wouldn't be a woman left alive, alive or a virgin. If Duncan is dead, I hope it's not Nash who responds to the call. Maybe this time with a rubber. Maybe they sell them in the bathroom there. Since he had such a good look, I ask if he saw any bruises, bites, bee stings, needle marks, anything. It's nothing like that, he says. No suicide note? Nope, no apparent cause of death, he says. Nash turns the sandwich around in his hands and licks the mustard and mayo leaking out of the end. He says, you remember Jeffrey Dahmer? Nash licks and says, he didn't set out to kill so many people. He just thought you could drill a hole in somebody's skull, pour in some drain cleaner, and make them your sex zombie. Dahmer just wanted to be getting more. So what do I get for my 50 bucks? A name's all I got, he says. I give him two 20s and a 10. With his teeth, he pulls a slice of steak out of the sandwich. The meat hangs against his chin before he tosses his head back to flip it into his mouth. Chewing, he says, yeah, I'm a pig. And his breath is nothing but mustard. He says, the last person to talk to them, their call history on both their cell phones, is said her name is Helen Hoover Boyle. He says, you dumped that stock like I told you.
chapter 9. It's the same William and Mary Brew cabinet. According to the note card taped to the front, it's black lacquered pine with Persian scenes and silver gilt, round bun feet, and the pediment done up a pile of carved curls and shells. It has to be the same cabinet. We churn right here, walk down a tight corridor of arm wars, then churn right again at the Regency press cupboard, then left at the federal sofa. But here we are again. Helen Hoover Boyle, Helen Hoover Boyle puts her finger against the silver gilt, the tarnished men and women of Persia court life, and says, I have no idea what you're talking about. She killed Baker and Penny Stewart. She called them on their cell phones sometime the day before they died. She read them each the culling song. You think I killed those unfortunate people by singing to them? She says. Her suit is yellow today, but her hair is still big and pink. Her shoes are yellow, but her neck still hung with gold chains and beads. Her cheeks look pink and soft with too much powder. It didn't take much digging to find out the Stewarts were the people who'd bought a house on Exeter Drive, a lovely historic house with seven bedrooms and cherry paneling throughout the first floor, a house they plan to tear down and replace a plan that infuriated Helen Hoover Boyle. Oh, Mr. Strenator, she says, if you could just hear yourself. From where we're standing, a tight corridor of furniture stretches a few yards in every direction. Beyond that, each corridor turns or branches into more corridors, armoires squeeze side by side, sideboards wedged together. Anything short, armchairs or sofas or tables only lets you see through to the next corridor of hutches, the next wall of grandfather clocks, enameled screens, Georgian secretaries. This is where she struck she this is where she suggested we meet. Where we could talk in private, one of those warehouse antique stores. In this maze of furniture, we keep meeting the same William and Mary Bureau cabinet, then the same Regency press cupboard. We're going in circles. We're lost. And Helen Boyle says, have you told anyone else about your killer song? Only my editor. And what did your editor say? I think he's dead. And she says, what a surprise. She says, you must feel terrible. Above us, crystal chandeliers hang at different heights, all of them cloudy and gray as powdered wigs, frayed wires twisted where their chains hook onto each roof beam. Their severed wires, the dusty dead light bulbs. Each chandelier is just another ancient aristocratic head cut off and hanging upside down. Above everything arches the warehouse roof a lot of bow trusses supporting corrupted steel, supporting corrugated steel. Just follow me, Helen Boyle says. Isn't moss supposed to grow only on the north side of the armoire? She wets two fingers in her mouth and holds them up. The Rococo vitrines, the Jacobian bookcases, the Gothic revival high boys, all carved and varnished, the French provisional wardrobes crowd around us, the Edwardian wal walnut curio cabinets, the Victorian pier mirrors, the Renaissance revival chiffre robes, the walnut and mahogany, ebony and oak, the melon bulb legs and car cabaret legs and linen fold panels past the point where any corridor turns there's just more queen anne chiffoniers more bird's eye maple mother of pearl inlay and gilded bronze or malu our footsteps echo against the concrete floor the steel roof hums with rain and she says don't you feel somehow buried in history? With her pink fingernails, from out of her yellow and white bag, she takes a ring of keys. She makes a fist around the keys so only the longest and sharpest juts out between her fingernails. 
Do you realize that anything you can do in your lifetime will be meaningless a hundred years from now, she says? Do you think a century from now that anyone will even remember the Stuarts? She looks from one polished surface to the next, tabletops, dressers, drawers, all with her reflection floating across them. People die, she says. People dare tear down houses, but furniture, fine, beautiful furniture, it just goes on and on. Surviving everything, she says. Armoires are the cockroaches of our culture. And without breaking her stride, she drags the steel point of the key across the polished walnut face of the cabinet. The sound is as quiet as anything sharp slashing something soft. The scar is deep and shows the raw, cheap pine under the veneer. She stops in front of a wardrobe with beveled glass doors. Think of all the generations of women who looked in that mirror, she says. They took it home. They aged in that mirror. They died. All those beautiful young women. But here's the wardrobe, worth more now than ever. A parasite surviving the host. A big, fat predator looking for its next meal. In this maze of antiques, she says, there are ghosts of everyone who has ever owned this furniture, everyone rich and successful enough to prove it. All of their talent and intelligence and beauty outlived by decorative junk, all of the success and accomplishment this furniture was supposed to represent, it's all vanished. She says, in the vast scheme of things, does it really matter how the Stuarts died? I ask, how did she find out about the calling spell? Was it because her son Patrick died? And she just keeps walking, trailing her fingers along the carved edges, the polished surfaces, marrying the knobs and smearing the mirrors. It didn't take much digging to find out how her husband died. A year after Patrick, he was found in bed, dead, without a mark, without a suicide note, without a cause. And Helen Boyle says, how was your editor found? Out of her yellow and white purse, she takes a gleaming silver little pair of pliers and a screwdriver, so clean and exact they could be used in surgery. She opens the door on a vast carved and polished armoire and says, hold this steady for me, please. I hold the door and she's busy on the inside for a moment until the door's latch and handle fall free and hit the floor at my feet. A minute later, and she has the door handles and the gilded bronze ormolu. She's taken everything metal except the hinges and put them in her purse. Stripped, the armoire looks crippled, blind, castrated, mutilated. And I ask, why is she doing this? Because I love this piece, she says, but I'm not going to be another one of its victims. She closes the doors and puts her tools away in her purse. I'll come back for it after they cut the price down to what it cost when it was new, she says. I love it, but I'll only have it on my own terms. We walk a few more steps and the corridor breaks into a forced into a forest of hall trees and hat racks, umbrella stands and coat racks. In the distance, beyond that is another wall of break fronts and armoires. Elizabeth, Elizabethan, she says, touching each piece, Tudor, Eastlake, Stickley. When someone takes two p old pieces, says a mirror, say a mirror and a dresser, and fastens them together, she explains that experts call that product a married piece. As an antique, it's considered worthless. When someone takes two pieces apart, say a buffet and a hutch, and sells them separately, experts call the pieces divorced. And again, she says, they're worthless. I say, how I've been trying to find every copy of the poems book, I say how important it is that no one ever discovers the spell. After what happened to Duncan, I swear I'm going to burn 
all my notes and forget I ever knew the culling spell. And what if you can't forget it? She says, what if it stays in your head, repeating itself like one of those silly advertising songs? What if it's always there, like a loaded gun, waiting for someone to annoy you? I won't use it. Hypothetically speaking, of course, she says, what if I used to swear the same thing? Me, a woman you're saying accidentally killed her own child and husband. Someone who's been tortured by the power of this curse. If someone like me eventually began using the song, what makes you think that you won't? I just won't. Of course you won't, she says, and then laughs without making a sound. She turns right past a bigger credenza fast, and she turns again past the Art Nouveau console, and for a minute, she's out of sight. I hurry to catch up, still lost, saying, if we're going to find our way out of this, I think we need to stay together. Just ahead of us is a William and Mary bureau cabinet, black lacquered pine with Persian scenes and silver gilt around bun feet and a pediment done up in a pile of carved curls and shells and leading me deeper into the thicket of cabinets and closets and breakfast fr break fronts and high boys and rocking chairs and hall trees and bookcases. Helen Hoover Boyle says she needs to tell me a little story. How are you guys doing? We should just, let's do chapter 10 then. Well, we can stop after that. Okay, so chapter 10. Back at the newsroom, everybody's quiet. People are whispering around a coffee maker. People are listening with their mouths hanging open. Nobody's crying. Henderson catches me hanging my jacket and says, you call Regent Pacific Airlines about their crab lice? And I say, nobody's saying anything until a suit is filed. And Henderson says, just so you know, you report to me now. He says, Duncan's just not irresponsible. It turns out he's dead. Dead in bed without a mark. No suicide note. No cause of death. His landlord found him and called the paramedics. And I ask, any sign he was sodomized? And Henderson jerks his head back just to trace and says, say what? Did somebody fuck him? God, no, Henderson says. Why would you ask such a thing? And I say, no reason. At least Duncan wasn't somebody's dead body sex. At least Duncan wasn't somebody's dead body sex doll. I say, if somebody asks me, if somebody needs me, I'll be in the clipping library. There's some facts I need to check. Just a few years of newspaper stories I need to read a few spools of microfilm to run through. And Henderson calls after me, don't go far just because Duncan's dead. That don't mean you're off the dead baby beat. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but watch out for those damn words. According to the microfilm in 1983 in Vienna, Austria, a 23-year-old nurse's aide gave an overdose of morphine to an old woman who was begging to die. The 77-year-old woman died, and the aide, Walter Wager, found she loved having the power of life and death. It's all here in spool after spool of microfilm, just the facts. At first, it was just to help dying patients. She worked in an enormous hospital for the elderly and chronically ill. People lingered there wanting to die. Besides morphine, the young woman invented what she called her water cure. To relieve suffering, you just pinch the patient's nose shut. You depress the tongue, and you pour water down the throat. Death is slow torture, but old people are always found dead with water collected in their lungs. The young woman called herself an angel. It looked very natural. 
it was noble, heroic deed that Wagner was doing. She was the ultimate end to suffering and misery. She was gentle and caring and sensitive, and she only took those who begged to die. She was the angel of death. By 1987, there were three more angels. All four aides worked the night shift. By now, the hospital was nicknamed the Death Pavilion. Instead of ending suffering, the four women began to give their water care to patients who snored or wet the bed or refused to take medication or buzz the nurse's station late at night. Any petty annoyance and the patient died the next night. Any time a patient complained about anything, Walter Wagner would say, this one gets a ticket to God and glug, glug, glug. The ones who got on my nerve, she told authorities, were dispatched directly to a free bed with the good Lord. In 1989, an old woman called Wagner a common slut. Oh, and night, sorry. In 1989, an old woman called Wagner a common slut and got the water cure. Afterward, the angels were drinking in a tavern, laughing and mimicking the old woman's convulsions and the look on her face. A doctor sitting nearby overheard. By then, the Vienna health authorities estimate that almost 300 people had been cured. Wagner got life in prison. The other angels got lesser sentences. We could decide whether these old fogies lived or died, Wagner said at her trial. Their ticket to God was long overdue in any case. The story he Helen Hoover Boyle told me is true. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So just relax, Helen Boyle told me, and just enjoy the ride. She said, even absolute corruption has its perks. She said to think of all the people you'd like out of your life. Think of all the loose ends you could tie up. The revenge. Think how easy it would be. And still echoing in my head was Nash. Nash was there drooling over the idea of any woman anywhere cooperating and beautiful for at least a few hours before things start to cool down and fall apart. Tell me, he said, how would that be different than most love relationships? Anyone and everyone could become your next sex zombie just because this Australian, Austrian, nurse and Helen Boyle and John Nash can't control themselves. That doesn't mean I'll become a reckless, impulsive killer. Henderson comes to the library doorway and shouts, Strediter, did you turn off your pager? We just got a call about another cold baby. The editor is dead. Long live the editor. Here's the new boss, same as the old boss. And sure, the world just might be a better place without certain people. Yeah, the world could just be perfect without a little trimming here and there. With a little trimming here and there. A little house cleaning. Some unnatural selection. But no, I'm never going to use the culling song again. Never again. But even if I did use it, I wouldn't use it for revenge. I wouldn't use it for convenience. I certainly wouldn't use it for sex. No, I'd only ever use it for good. And Henderson yells, Strediter, did you ever call about the first class crab lice? Did you call about the health club's butt eating fungus? You need to pester those people at the tree line or you'll never get anything. And fast as a flinch, me flinching the other way down the hall, the culling song spools through my head while I grab my coat and head out the door. But no, I'm never going to use it. That's that. I'm just not ever. Thank you guys. So we're at chapter 11. Um, next time, maybe we can go for longer than two hours, but I like to keep them at about two hours so that um, when you guys come back or people want to listen to them, they're broken down in little chunks that are 
able to be eaten. And also my voice doesn't get weird because when I'm on Zav Girl, sometimes we do Darlie and um, people have commented when we go like uh, after a couple of hours that my voice starts to sound fried. So how are you guys doing? Do you guys enjoy it? Thank you guys for being here. Um, I will put up, I'll see if, um, cause originally it was supposed to be Saturday and Sunday and I was like, oh, totally. I could do it back to back. I will try to do this again tomorrow. Um, maybe a little later. Thank you, Odin, for snoring with us. He's still snoring. I didn't think he would this early. Um, but I'll put up a thumbnail. Thank you guys for following. Thank you guys for being here and letting me read to you guys. I hope you enjoyed it and could uh, follow along. <laughs> and thank you, Zav Girl, for modding for me. I hope it was fun. Thank you, guys. Have a really good... And Zav, are you going... I don't think you're going live after this, right? She might be going live, but I, I don't think so. I think she's just wanted to relax after this. But see you guys soon at um, Zav Girls or if we decide to do one here, um, the second part. But it will be this week, you guys. You're not going to have to wait. We'll try to finish this book this week, okay? So thank you guys so much. Love you all. Good night.